Hello everyone, welcome to the Geoecologist. I am Dr. Krishnanand and in this session we are going to learn about the evolution of geographical thought in the British school. So what were the factors that helped the development of geography as a subject of advanced study in Britain? So while parallelly we see that there was development going on in Germany and France, so British school of geographical thought also emerged during the same time. So they propounded some great theories, some interesting insights into various branching of geographical knowledge that we are going to learn in this session. So before we go ahead, please like and subscribe to our channel and don't forget to press the bell icon. Let's understand that development of British school of thought was almost again contemporary to German school of thought as well as French school of thought. So the modern foundations of geography as a field of advanced study was also happening at the same time parallelly in Germany, France as well as Britain. So let's understand the sequence of events that happened. So first of all what happened was that a separate department of geography was established at Oxford University where Hafford John Mackinder was the first professor in 1887 when we see. So Mackinder who formally started this British geographical thought school at Oxford University in 1887. Apart from Mackinder, the other geographers like John Herbertson, L. W. Lyde, C. B. Wavset, George Gowdy, then we have Percy M. Roxby, Sidney William Woolridge, then we have L. Dudley Stamp and many more. So all these scholars contributed to the development of further more knowledge in terms of geographical thought. So these geographers worked on various facets of geography and enriched it as a subject, as a distinct discipline with scientific branches of knowledge under British school of geographical thought. The modern geographical thought in Britain had been evolving since the establishment of Royal Geographical Society in 1830 itself. So what happened? The Royal Geographical Society was established in 1830. So what we see that geography was not that new here as well, but there was a difference. So before this period, geography was taught only at school level in Britain. So that is important to understand that geography was not part of the university system. So more geographers like Mary Somerville, whose work on physical geography published in 1848 and Francis Galton's weather map, which was published in 1861 had initial impacts on geographical studies in British school of geographical thought. So it was Mackinder who formally started British geographical thought at school of geography in Oxford University in 1887. So now let's understand the works of Mackinder. He became very popular by his research that was titled geographical pivot of history. Now this geographical pivot of history is very interesting because when we see something as a pivot it means the rest of the things are revolving around this particular pivot. So what is that? Let's understand. In 1904 he formulated the concept of geographical pivot of history which is known as heartland theory of Mackinder. So this is being taught nowadays under political geography syllabus. So let's understand. He summarized the view of global strategy in his very famous lines. So what are the lines? Who rules Eastern Europe commands the heartland. Then next statement is who rules heartland commands the world island and who rules world island commands the entire world. So this is the summary in three statements of what heartland theory was all about. So you'll be also looking at the map of Mackinder, how he summarized what was heartland, what was the world island. So let's understand that. But before that, we also understand that this was not well accepted during that time. It was also criticized because of the rising importance of power, satellite technologies, missiles, importance of Arctic region because of its encircled by superpowers like United States, Russia, Northern Europe, Northern China, Japan, etc. But nevertheless, Mackinder laid the foundation of geostrategic theories which inspired various geographers across the world to study geostrategic and political geography. So that's important that in terms of geopolitics, if we see, his contributions are one of the most important contributions in early 20th century. 
So let's look at this particular map of Makinda. So what he says is this particular area, the Eastern Europe section, this is going to be a pivot along which the entire world is going to revolve. So whosoever commands this area, controls this area, will automatically control the marginal parts, the world island parts, and also the entire world part. So the command has to be on this pivot area. So the idea was to control over Eastern Europe. So this idea was promoted in 1904 and remember what was the situation in World War I and II. Everybody was concerned about this particular section of this world. So this theory became really popular during that era. Next scholar in line is huge Robert Mill. He was influenced by Darwinian's concept of environmentalism and Otto Schluter's concept which was about morphological approach. So his concept of physiography also included geography of man. So that is interesting that here geography of man is being talked about. So it was not just pure physical geography but influence of human beings were also considered in the works of Mill. His view was very similar to Richofen, the system of spatially distributed phenomena overlaid as a pyramid where its base contains the physical structure and on the top humans sociological or the economic features are there. So he wrote a book which is famous by the name of Realm of Nature and see the year it was 1891. So during that time he wrote this work Realm of Nature with the aim at studying water published in 1891. So he prepared rainfall maps on the basis of 50 years of average rainfall data at that time for the Britain. So that was interesting that he was largely a physical geographer, but he completely did not de-recognize the influence of man. So he talked about geography of man as well, but largely his work is in the part of physical geography. Then one of the most prominent scholars of British school of thought was a Scottish geographer by the name of Sir Patrick Geddes. So he is very famous. So he was inspired by Vidal de la Blache and Laplace research as we studied in French school of geographical thought. So as per his view, family life now look here, it is talking about family life that depends upon family lifestyle and family budget. So it's talking about generative the way of life as well, and also on the budget. So it was the concept of Laplace. So Laplace concept and Vidal de la Blache's concept was there as the main point in his concept of urban theories that he later on talked about. So he gave the concept of region as well to the architectural field, not to the normal general geographical field, but he talked about regional architecture and also coined this term that we study in urban geography that is conurbation. So urban conurbation, the concept of agglomeration of small urban centers with a larger urban center that we study is given by this person called Patrick Geddes and he elaborated later on neo techniques as well as the way of remaking a world apart from over commercialization and money dominance. So he wanted a world that could be away from this over commercialization using the new technology. So that's important in his work. The next scholar is Andrew J. Herbertson. The very famous study of regionalization was his core and Patrick Geddes had immense impacts on his work. So while working with Geddes at Oxford, he studied the world natural regions and divided it into 15 divisions, into 15 natural regions that we see on the basis of homogeneity in what? Surface features, climate and vegetation. So that's important, Herbert's study of regionalization of world into 15 natural regions. Then as per his view, there is an interaction between inorganic and organic components in natural regions that he talked about the interaction phase, it means he was talking about the ecological concept that had developed. So he further pointed out all natural regions are the physical regions purely. He had an emphasis on the regionalization through consideration of physical regions. So each region according to him represents a unique imprint of man environment relationship but still in the, his study environment was the dominating factor. Now. Next scholar in British School of Geographical Thought is H.G. Fleur. So Fleur was a professor at Manchester and he viewed human problems that must be understood not only through space, not only through space is the catch here, but also through time. So he was the first of the contemporary scholars 
who emphasized on the word time more than just space. So he talked about space and time both in his work and he explained this in his work called Corridor of Time. So he was one of the pioneers of this work which emphasized on not just geography through spaces but geography through corridors of time. So he wanted to elucidate regional personality through city structures, its social institutions and functions. So largely in the urban connotation, his work is there. So he authored another book named Human Geography in Western Europe. So that is interesting book in which he explained this geography not through space but also through the time. Then as per his view, the only environment does not influence the region but human influences are equally important. So what we see here is the possibilist thought process here as well in the works of H.G. Fleur. The next scholar that we study is P.M. Roxby. So Roxby's concept is again related to the methods of regional studies. He talked about demarcation of natural regions based on geology, drainage, coastline, climate and vegetation. So largely we see all major physical and biotic features in terms of vegetations that he referred to and he also referred to the man-environment relationship which was in vogue during this particular time period. So he proposed a concept of human region. Now first time what we see is the concept of human region coming in rather than human ecology at the same time. So let's understand this human region that he pointed out that differential spatial relations account for difference between two different human regions within a natural region. So he said that natural region was an umbrella under which several human regions are there. So he viewed man must adjust with changing natural region and its environment. So largely again deterministic school of thought but more into the regional studies. Now very famous geomorphologist as we know S.W. Woolridge. So he was professor at King's College London. He is in association with Morgan wrote a book on geomorphology that we see here an outline of geomorphology the physical basis of geography. So one of the founders propounders of geomorphology in British school of thought according to him physical geography is the platform for human life and human activities. So in order to express his views he authored another book entitled geographers as scientists to emphasize on the work of geographers and he named another book spirit and purpose of geography that was very famous amongst academicians in which he described that what should be the role of geographers in studying physical geography. Now another person who is most famous in India as well and also in British School of Geographical Thought is Sir Doodley Stamp. So famously we say him L.D. Stamp, Lawrence Doodley Stamp. He worked as an academician and professor at universities like Rangoon, London and was awarded honorary doctorates by several universities that we see here. So he authored about 30 books in his lifetime but most famous five are listed here. You can have a look at this. The Geography of Life and Death, Handbook of Commercial Geography, Land of Britain, Use and Misuse, what we see here is land use and land change, that concept we have in modern geography is coming largely from the school of British school of thought through his works, our developing world, Asia, a regional and economic geography and land for tomorrow, the underdeveloped world. So larger part of his work that you see here is talking about the developing nations or the underdeveloped world. So Stamp's most significant work was county level survey. So what we say here is cadastral mapping that you see in today's world. Cadastral mapping was something that he did at that time in Britain. So that also came to India as it was a British Raj that time. So county level survey was also done in India as well and very famously his student R. L. Singh that we know in Indian context by the name of Ram Lochan Singh, a very eminent professor at Banaras Hindu University. He also did this work under him and further brought this study to India which became almost like a paradigm for Indian geographers as land use land classification surveys. So being a president of International Geographical Union he always has been active and was motivating in terms of scientific methods in geographical studies. So LD Stamp's work is largely focusing upon the problems and prospects of geographical thought in developing nations. Now coming further more ahead during the time of quantitative revolution in geography, largely in the 1960s, Richard Chorley is supposed to be one of the stalwarts of quantification. Along with 
His friend Peter Haggett, he worked on several applications of statistical techniques and mathematical methods in geographical analysis. So larger part of statistical analysis and quantitative analysis that we study today in geography can be credited to Richard Shorley and Peter Haggett. So let's understand what he wrote along with the works of Peter Haggett was these five contributions. Frontiers in geographical teaching, models in geography, socio-economic models in geography, physical information models in geography, and integrated models in geography. So all those models of geography work that we see based on mathematical methods and statistical techniques have been largely contributed by Richard Shirley. And furthermore, his friend Peter Haggett, what we see here, so he along with Richard Chorley, as we see statistical and mathematical techniques propounder, his interesting work that we see is very famous in geography among geographers, so that is locational analysis. It means the importance of particular location. So that was interesting in terms of statistical methods and mathematical techniques that we use today itself in terms of analysis of a particular locations with various factors attributed to it. So this work was done by Peter Haggett. And another work is Geography, a Modern Synthesis in 1975, which is very famous, which mainly encompassed the scope of geography and its analytical methods and techniques, along with numerous maps, diagrams, photographs. So he, along with Richard Chorley, is the pioneer of quantitative methods in geographical thought. Now, let's understand about this particular gentleman called David Harvey. He is one of the famous British-born Marxist economic geographer who has authored many books and essays that have been prominent in the development of modern geography as a discipline. He is proponent of the idea of right to the city. So earlier in his work, which is the most famous work by David Harvey in 1969 it came, Explanation in Geography, he explained several modes of explanations in geography. It means the phenomenon that we study in geography could be expressed and explained in several different ways. So it was a landmark text in the methodology building and philosophy of geography, applying principles drawn from philosophy of science in general to the field of geographical knowledge and geographical thought. So in his other book that is Social Justice and the City, he argued that geography could not remain objective in the face of urban poverty and associated ills, that is the evils. So what we see in his work is that one kind of work that is explanation in geography contributed to the methodology, the study philosophy in terms of geographical thought, but the other works are related to largely his Marxist and economist approach to the urban theories or the social theories. So now when we have learned about the various contributions of great scholars of British school of geographical thought, we must understand that furthermore advancement, especially in terms of land use survey, cadastral mapping, cartography, economic geography and all various branching of geographical knowledge was further done in the British school of geographical thought. And also because India was a British colony, so geography in India had a great impact of the contributions of these British school geographers. So we'll be talking about the contribution of American School of Geographical Thought in the lectures to come. So stay safe, stay tuned, all the best wishes.